Well, the content of my talk is not such a good match to my title. Uh, I decided to give a sort of broader perspective talk. It's the last talk. And so I might wind up echoing things that we've been hearing from others the last couple of days, but that's fine. The short version of the talk that I'm not giving is it's really hard to make a firewall on a tabletop so you don't have to be afraid to go into the lab. Lenny gave us some wise advice that he sent to the speakers. What we're attempting is nothing less than creating a new branch of physics. And to get that ball rolling, it's important to communicate to one another the things that we know and don't know and what we're really trying to do, but at a high enough level that we can really communicate. So we can start by asking, why is it that we want to study quantum gravity? Of course, we would like to have as complete an understanding as we can achieve of all the fundamental interactions in nature. And we also hope to resolve deep puzzles about what happens inside black holes and how black holes process information. We would like to have a better understanding of what quantum gravity can tell us about the initial conditions in the very early universe. But another, which is particularly appropriate for this meeting, is that we hope the study of quantum gravity will teach us broader lessons which are applicable in other contexts in physics. And that we might, if I paraphrase what Stevin said yesterday, learn how to use gravitational intuition to understand complex emergent quantum phenomena. And also, quantum gravity is fun. Mm -hmm. It might be worth pausing to note that the words quantum gravity in the lab mean different things to different people. Actually, I was just thinking as I made the slide, it was 222 years ago that Cavendish measured the gravitational constant on a tabletop. Newton had predicted that such a measurement would be impossible. So it's good to recall that even great physicists sometimes underestimate the ingenuity of experimentalists and how advancing technology can make new types of experimental observations possible. One thing that might teach us something interesting about quantum gravity would be if we can detect the gravitational waves produced during inflation. That really is a quantum effect. And if such a detection is made, it could be quite revealing in a number of ways. But we don't know whether that's going to happen. There have been experiments investigating the properties of analog Hawking radiation in supersonic flow, for example, in BECs, which are intrinsically interesting as experiments, there are rather heroic plans to detect entanglement produced by gravitational interactions among falling bodies. Uh, there are also ongoing efforts to at least tool up for attempting to observe intrinsic decoherence that could be driven by gravitational effects when superpositions of masses in different positions are prepared. Now, you might be skeptical about any of these experimental thrusts can teach us something that uh, we don't know or care to know about gravitation. But I think it is worth pondering whether these advancing experimental capabilities could be directed towards questions that we would find fruitful to investigate. We've learned a lot about quantum gravity. And a lot of the blessings have flowed from the discovery. It's now 22 years of ADS-CFT, holographic duality. But our current path really uh, received impetus from the observation about 12 years ago that we can view geometry as emerging from entanglement in the context of ADS-CFT, that it is, in a sense, entanglement which is holding space together. And every once in a while, I have to shake myself in amazement uh, to remind myself how 
remarkable it is that you can have two quantum systems and entangle them without coupling. And if they have holographic duals, that can describe a shared interior. Alice and Bob in these different systems, which are entangled but not coupled, can, it seems, fall into the same black hole and fall in love. It's very poetic, also kind of tragic. But above all, <laughs> it's remarkable. Um, for the quantum informationists, it's very satisfying and uh, helps to bring us into the game to recognize that space-time, the holographic dictionary specifically, can be viewed as a kind of quantum error correcting code. And that point of view has solidified uh, a number of insights. For example, it gives us a sharper way of understanding why we can't have exact global symmetries in bulk quantum gravity. Thinking about black holes has stimulated investigations of fast scrambling, which have been applied more broadly, as we've been hearing, and have given us to more broadly applicable lessons about the properties of chaos. The idea that there's a relationship between geometry and computational complexity is another remarkable idea, and it helps to bring the theoretical computer scientists to the table and contribute to our further understanding. And it's an amazing discovery, uh, also much remarked upon here, that there can be quite simple systems, specifically the SYK system, which have um, holographic duals which are helpful for understanding how the system behaves. And it's an older story that using ADS-CFT, we can get insights or an understanding of strongly coupled boundary systems by relating them to their weakly coupled gravitational duals like the quark gluon plasma or strongly correlated condensed matter systems. Of course, we're still lacking uh, many things from our understanding of quantum gravity. We have still a far from complete understanding of the code which describes the dictionary relating boundary and bulk in ADS-CFT. We don't have a very clear understanding of why the bulk physics is local on distance scales, which are small compared to the ADS curvature scale. And that's related to our not very satisfying state of understanding of how quantum gravity works in asymptotically flat space-time, and especially in the sitter space, which is relevant if we want to do cosmology, I think we still have conceptual puzzles about how to think about measurements that are performed inside of black holes behind horizons. That's the issue that uh, people sometimes speak of as the state dependence of the encoded interior. Uh, there are still some mysteries about what exactly happens when you fall into a black hole. If you look at it from the boundary point of view, when you're outside the black hole, properties of the interior are extremely complex to get access to. Once we pass through the horizon in the bulk, these become very easy to access. How do we think about that from the boundary point of view? I don't think we understand that very well. Uh, this recent progress hasn't really touched on what happens when you uh, reach the singularity. Now, all these questions are about what it's like to be in the interior of a black hole. And you may say, well, I don't really care about that. But for all we know, we are all inside a black hole. So in that case, you probably care. <laughs> um, it would be nice, it would be nice to know from a, uh, a computational complexity perspective just how, how hard is it to simulate quantum gravity if we have a quantum computer? Is it a task that we can perform efficiently with the types of quantum computers that we envision building in the next couple of decades? And now we know there are some theories that have useful holographic duals. No doubt many do not, but we don't have at all a very detailed understanding of what are the cases in which there's a holographic dual, which gives us a convenient way of describing things. And that's an issue where maybe experiment can help us make progress. Um, it's already been discussed today that there has been exciting progress just in the past year on the information problem. Uh, Daniel filled us in on that. I'll just mention that 
we now at least can do computations of the so-called page curve, which describes how information becomes accessible outside the black hole as it evaporates. And that progress was facilitated by extending the ryu takianaga connection between geometry and entanglement to include uh, quantum effects. From the quantum information point of view, recently developed advances in understanding approximate quantum error correction come into play in understanding the circumstances under which we need to know the black hole microstates to decode the radiation and when we don't need to know them. It's an issue of how much information we're trying to extract. And um, we at least have an emerging, more convincing picture of how we can have black holes that evaporate without the need for firewalls. I'll just say a little bit more about that. That's the talk I decided not to give. Um, well, of course, how many times have we heard about the thermal field double? Uh, just about every talk. Um, and that has many lessons to teach us. And in particular, the essence of the firewall puzzle is that in the case of a black hole, which has already radiated away most but not all of its entropy, as it continues to emit Hawking radiation, that Hawking radiation, it seems, wants to be entangled with the interior of the black hole and also with the previously emitted radiation. And we can't have it both ways without violating the principle of monogamy of quantum entanglement. In the case of the two-sided black hole, we can kind of see how that works. There's a black hole which is encoded with another system, in that case, a second black hole. And the reason that radiation that's being emitted now can be entangled with both the system the black hole is entangled with and the interior is because they're both the same system. And the audacious idea is that that principle applies more broadly in the case of a black hole that forms from clats and then evaporates, that we can think of the interior of the black hole as being encoded in the previously emitted radiation. So the way uh, I like to look at this and work um, I've been doing with Isaac Kim, who's here, and my student Eugene Tang, is that in the case of a black hole, which is still macroscopic, but has been evaporating for a long time, the Hawking radiation can plausibly be expected to be pseudo-random. And that means that although it's not precisely thermal, you can't distinguish it from an exactly thermal state, except with exponentially small success probability, by doing any reasonable computation. If you're limited to a polynomial time in the black hole entry, uh, entropy computation, you can't tell it's not truly thermal. So in that sense, Stephen Hawking was very close to being correct in saying that the radiation would be thermal, even though information theoretically we think it is becoming nearly pure as the black hole evaporates. That would also be true of a um, piece of coal uh, burning, no? Well, it's something, anything that scrambles stuff up really well. And in fact, in, we now uh, know that under widely believed assumptions about computational complexity, that um, there are pseudo-random states in this sense which can be efficiently prepared. And so if it can be done, something that scrambles up information very well should be able to do it, and nothing scrambles things up better than a black hole. And there's an implication of that pseudo-randomness of the radiation, which is uh, that it's possible to show that a code exists encoded in the radiation system with the property that any agent with access to that radiation who is limited to doing polynomial time computations can only perform operations which nearly commute with all the operators acting on the encoded system. So in other words, if you are computationally bounded, as we all are, if you can only do polynomial time computations, polynomial and black hole entropy, then you can't in any way influence the interior by acting on the radiation. So the semi-classical causal structure is very robust under realistic limitations on what the outside observer can do. If you do 
exponential time computations, then you can tear space-time apart and completely destroy its semi-classical structure. You could create, create firewalls in particular. Uh, but realistically, the space-time semi-classical structure is very robust. So what can we learn from experiments about the things that we don't understand very well yet? Well, of course, we've learned that geometry, in the case of ADS-CFT and perhaps more broadly, is a property arising from entanglement. And as uh, we've heard in some of the talks today, entanglement structure is experimentally accessible in principle. The experiments are not easy, and they become especially hard as the system size grows. But in principle, we can explore the geometry by measuring properties of entanglement in a holographically dual theory. This issue of bulk locality is something that perhaps is experimentally accessible. What seems ex um, mysterious about bulk locality is that we can, operator we can have operators from the boundary point of view which act on overlapping regions and don't seem to have ver any very good reason to commute with one another. But secretly, they describe bulk operators, which are space-like separated from one another in the bulk. And so from the bulk point of view, they have a good reason to commute. And whether operators commute is something that, in principle, one can study in transport experiments or in linear response experiments. So in some str strongly coupled uh, systems, we could experimentally probe the locality of the dual theory. Of course, we'd like to be able to study the formation and evaporation of a black hole, including small black holes. And in principle, in the boundary theory, that corresponds to following the evolution of some excited state on the boundary, which in principle we could do in the lab. Of course, there's already been a lot of interest in probing the fast scrambling behavior of a variety of chaotic systems, which was stimulated, at least in part, by thinking about how black holes scramble information. And we've heard a lot at this meeting about experimental approaches to making such observations, which can continue to become more refined and give us more detailed information, perhaps, uh, about, uh, for example, the Lyapunov spectrum of the chaotic system. Um, it may be hard to com compute higher order gravitational corrections to the semi-classical gravity, especially non-perturbative ones, and potentially someday we'll be able to measure those corrections instead by studying the boundary theory. Of course, we would like to learn about holographic dictionaries which go beyond uh, ADS to get insights in particular, perhaps, to a de Sitter space. And that's something that eventually we may hope to be able to explore experimentally and we've heard a lot about the idea of studying the traversal of a wormhole in the bulk as a type of coherent teleportation. And we can hope, maybe in the not too distant future, to do a kind of wor wormhole tomography to do ex experiments which reveal uh, the experience of passing through the wormhole. And that's partly interesting because we can go beyond the leading semi-classical picture of the geometry, including corrections in the bulk, which might not be so easy to compute. And we could also study uh, more complex situations in which, say, multiple uh, boundary systems are entangled with one another. And exactly what the bulk picture of such phenomena is, we're, we don't understand clearly now. So. Of course, we can think more broadly about what we can do with these quantum platforms in the near term and beyond. And what we expect that is that a important application of quantum simulators and quantum computers will be simulating the dynamics of strongly coupled quantum systems, because that's so hard to do classically. So quantum computers should have a big advantage in simulating dynamics. But if you're a skeptic, you could say, well, what's really so interesting? If you have systems that are localized, then maybe they're not so highly entangled. So they might not be so hard to simulate classically. On the other hand, if they're strongly chaotic, uh, they become highly entangled quickly. 
but they just quickly converge to thermal equilibrium, and then after that, not much that's interesting happens. But we can expect that uh, nature is much more resourceful in surprising us that uh, there are a wide variety of dynamical phenomena that we may be able to discover with quantum platforms. And we've seen one example of that recently in the discussions of quantum many body scars, which were not really anticipated. In any case, both theorists and experimentalists have to think carefully about what are the right questions to ask about the dynamics which we should investigate with these tools. The question of digital versus analog quantum simulation came up in Ignacio's talk. In the NISC era in particular, NISC meaning noisy intermediate scale quantum, there will be limitations on both digital and analog platforms. Analog meaning a system which is tunable, but for which we don't have complete control. Digital meaning a universal gate-based quantum computer. Uh, well, one thing to note is that for the types of problems we might be interested in in holography and quantum gravity, uh, having all-to-all -all coupling can be very helpful, and that came up in a few of the talks. And it's very important to think in the near term about noise resilience and what types of observables we can study which are not so sensitive to the noise in the device. Now, um, are there reasons to be doing digital, that is, circuit-based? quantum simulation experiments in the near term, as uh, was already emphasized by Ignacio, simulating time evolution with a digital quantum computer can be very expensive. It takes a lot of gates. Uh, maybe we'll need fault-tolerant quantum computers to do it in a serious way. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be starting to try to do it now. I think the goal should be to develop the tools and insights that we'll need that we can build on in the future as the technology continues to advance. And digital does provide greater flexibility in the Hamiltonians that we can simulate and in the initial states that we can prepare. Of course, these remarks apply not just to simulations of quantum gravity, but to the applications of NIST technology more broadly. And already, though, with today's analog simulators, they really do have rather remarkable capabilities. I already mentioned the quantum many-body scars. We heard about the recent work of the uh, Greiner group. And uh, we are learning things about strongly coupled matter from these analog simulators already today. So what about simulation of quantum field theory? Well, to me, it seems remarkable to think that it's been 45 years since Ken Wilson told us to put QCD on the lattice. And I remember I was in graduate school in the late 70s when the first Euclidean Monte Carlo simulations of QCD were being done, the first measurements of the string tension, and that seemed exciting. But uh, some people recognized that it would probably be quite a while before that technology would advance to the point where it would really have an impact on the physics, our understanding of QCD, and, and that was true. It actually took a few decades for lattice QCD to begin to advance our understanding of physics and produce numbers that uh, were really informative. So we should have that type of time scale in mind when we're thinking about setting out towards quantum gravity in the lab. Of course, the reason we want to do quantum field theory with a quantum simulator rather than a Euclidean Monte Carlo Classical digital simulator is because there are some things that we'll never be able to measure with Euclidean Monte Carlo, and in particular, uh, we can't very easily access information about real-time evolution or the properties of matter at non-zero nucleon density. You could ask, is it uh, too expensive to use these circuit-based simulations for simulations of quantum field theory in the near term, uh, well, there may be limits to how successful we can be with circuit-based simulation for now. But I just reiterate what I said before in the broader setting, that we should be trying to do it now, because we need to develop the tools, the approaches that we're going to rely on as the technology continues to advance. 
and we're ready to take on more ambitious problems. In any of these simulations, using quantum platforms, we should always be asking what are the things that are classically hard that we can do only with quantum simulators? And the generic answer is it becomes classically hard if it's a process which generates a great deal of entanglement. A lot of things do. It could be very high energy collisions that produce lots of particles. Those are very highly entangled states. It could be quenches where the Hamiltonian changes suddenly. Um, and uh, those are the things we should be focusing on. The cases where we expect we're really doing something that would be hard to do classically. And that includes even the efforts in the near term where we might not be getting results that are sufficiently precise to quantitatively advance our understanding. But we should have that goal of doing the things that are classically hard. Of course, part of the reason we're interested in simulating quantum gravity, sorry, quantum field theory, is you can regard it as a stepping stone to quantum gravity if we're going to uh, simulate ADS-CFT, those uh, shells that we heard about yesterday, then we need to be able to simulate a conformal field theory. And we have to learn how to do that. And as always, we expect that trying to figure out how to do these things will lead us to new insights and concepts and methods. I think you could fairly say that about Wilson's ideas about lattice QCD and simulating quantum field theory on a digital computer in general. Uh, those efforts to understand how to do it gave us answers that were clearer than we had before to questions like, what really is quantum field theory? And thinking about simulating quantum gravity in the lab, likewise, can lead us, I hope, to a deeper understanding of questions like, what is string theory? So what can we be focusing on over the next 10 years? Well, of course, we've heard a lot of things about advancing experimental capabilities and theoretical ideas. But I think perhaps we can hope to make real progress on this idea of using gravitational intuition to understand emergent phenomena. That, that gives us an approach that may lead to qualitatively useful insights and might not be out of reach for relatively near-term technology. And this question of when does a quantum many-body system have a useful gravitational dual is something that experiments will hopefully guide us to a better understanding. But realistically, our goal in the near term should be to light the way for progress in the more distant future. I don't think we're going to be getting spectacular answers to questions like these even in the next 10 years, but we can develop the tools and the methods and the insights that we'll need to help us make further progress, to hasten the arrival of a new era where quantum technology is fueling advances in fundamental physics. And progress is going to rely on vibrant discussions that bridge communities facilitated by meetings like this one. So I think this was, has been a quite successful meeting. It's been exciting. And I was glad to be here. And uh, I hope we'll have more like it. And I think I left uh, plenty of time for discussion.